Hi, my name is Kyle, and I'm with the Korean Adoptee Stories. Uh, originally, I was actually not going to do any uh, Korean Adoptee Story related uh, events because I don't want to give off too much information as they're still trying to work uh, things through with the organization. But basically, the organization we were a part of kind of fell through. Um, it no longer exists at the moment. I don't know if I can make that public announcement, but right now they're on the workings of trying to. Uh, at least uh, continue on from what they left on. So even if the original organization is still there, some of the board members are still trying to uh, continue to uh, uh, work with their, their organization. So I guess I wanted to discuss, this is a topic that I wrote on Facebook that what sums it up is life as a lonely and ugly Asian male. <laughs> Excuse me for my rather... Uh, sarcastic uh kind of sense of humor but it basically kind of wanted me to come up with this topic and i think it's a a, a good topic and i think there are other uh adoptees especially, especially males that had similar issues so basically the story goes uh basically it was about someone that yes he might have came on too strong yes he wouldn't let her go but I kind of felt for him because he wrote in this uh, Facebook adoptee chat where he was dealing with rejection. And I think uh, as a male, or maybe even adoptees, or maybe if you're just a person in general, and I think it hits adoptees a little bit more about uh, rejection, I kind of felt for the guy. And I felt some of the responses, even though, though it might have been, it might have been the truth, maybe the truth hurts at the same time. I think there's still, there could have been a little bit more compassion with how, uh, with what was stated. I'll, I'll actually just read through the statement first before I introduce uh, um, another CAD that actually reached out to me through this, uh, this kind of issue is Mitchell Stone. So basically, I'm, I'm going to keep this person uh, censored, so I'm not going to give out any personal information, but if he's okay, I'm going to read what he wrote. Uh, so he wrote, just learned the girl I've been chasing had gone with the old a dozen times and chatting with almost daily for several years, found a new boyfriend again, and well, it isn't me. She said in the past she didn't feel we had much chemistry, even though we enjoy each other's company, and I have a number of likes and comments. We remain good friends. I don't like to give up, but do you think it's time I should? Is chemistry something that can grow over time, or is it fixed according to their particular moment in time? I was having a pretty good day, and then this got me feeling dejected again. I'll probably delete this later, and he wrote this in, in a in an Asian American chat on Facebook. So one of the, the statements that was pretty popular and that, I don't know, it, it honestly, even though she's telling the truth, it kind of bugged me and being as an adoptee that had hard time, I feel like finding dates and having the opportunities and chances, I think it, it even adds a bit more of a sting uh, what, uh, with rejection. And maybe everyone does feel the sense of rejection, but or maybe someone doesn't. And this is why I was kind of afraid to bring up this topic because I heard from other few Asian males that they do believe that there is kind of a, there's kind of a blocker. It's kind of difficult being an Asian male versus a different race, such as a, a Caucasian male. And uh, maybe it's different dating uh, from when you're a female versus a male, but I'll get back to that as soon as I read uh, her statement. So basically she wrote, She's not using you and didn't use you. Your ego, your pride is just going after her. I'm sure she said no before, but you didn't listen. You stuck the fork in the outlet, dude. You hurt yourself. You got to get out of your fantasy you made and face reality and take responsibility for what you did without blaming anyone else. You'll learn or get right if you talk manipulative like this about someone and choose to make yourself the victim. It's not even about chemistry. It's just the fact you didn't take rejection. She doesn't owe her time or feelings, and that's that. I don't know. That, that end part just... It, it, I feel for this guy, but I, I felt like that it, it, it's hurtful to me. I don't know why. Yeah, but was he, was the guy, I don't know anything about, was he in the morning about another topic about this girl? And then that's the reason why people were liking that status. Well, basically, he has 438 uh, people that reacted. A lot of them actually showed the, the sad face, which is nice. They put the like face and the hard face. I haven't read through all the comments, but what was your, your question? Well, is is the reason why she made that bold statement? We because don't. Maybe we don't, he wrote something else. That, that, so you're trying to do the devil's advocate. You're thinking that maybe he maybe he wrote something that 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 triggered it all, and you're not seeing it. 
which is true. So I don't know the full story, but anyways, this, we can still cover the topic. This regarding... topic kind of brought up, uh, what's it like being an Asian male trying to find dates and whether or not. And I have an example, my brother, myself, and uh, my, my friend, we just actually just met today and I'm glad he actually reached out to me because I don't know, that post has been kind of bothering me. Originally, I was not going to do any Korean adoptee stories until next year, but uh, something when he actually reached out to me, he told me a little bit about his story. And I, I don't know what you ladies think or guys think, but Mitch, I think you're a pretty good looking dude, don't you think? Uh, it's uh, by other people's admission. I let other people decide that, um, and that's kind of <laughs> how I roll with it, but I appreciate it. So I guess I wanted to ask you, when you saw my post, and basically I basically wrote like, uh, I basically wrote a big question about what people's, I wanted to do a poll of between male and female. Supposedly I have uh, bad thoughts and negative thoughts or probably false thoughts about being an Asian male, but I do believe there's still difficulties uh, being an Asian male. And Hey, Mitch, so go ahead and, and explain your s story. Maybe you could uh, ex explain who you are, uh, your age, and, and where you uh, live right now. Yeah, so my name is Mitchell Stone. I'm 22. Uh, I live in Colorado right now. Um, I'm in transition to find jobs, um, just like everybody in this twisted economy. Um, but yeah, that's uh, about it. I'm a Korean adoptee as well. Um, adopted at three months. So yeah, that's uh, kind of the gist of everything. So. So you saw my, my post where I wrote uh, kind of about this statement. You're kind of interested. What kind of, what kind of made you want to actually call me and reach out to me? I only say that because I think it's a very common feeling. I think for uh, not even just Asian men, I think men in general, it's not, um, it's not just related necessarily to being an Asian male. However, I think there are certain challenges and certain uh, I wouldn't necessarily say obstacles, I would say just unique circumstances um, that Asian men face that are different, say, than other uh, men. So, Can you explain a little bit, do you, have you had personal experiences with this uh, a kind of thing, being an Asian male? Can you describe some of the difficulties that you had finding women or a dating woman? Yeah, um, so growing up, I... I definitely didn't grow up in a diverse place. I and I think that uh, you know anybody growing up in the early two thousands, twenty tens, it's very a recent phenomenon to see the diversity that we have right now. Because um, when I was growing up, it was really just Bruce Lee, Jet Li, uh, Jackie Chan stuff, and those are fine. But th that's about the extent of an Asian Asian male representation, um, and they weren't. There was no diversity in those roles. It was always just either the high school nerd or it was the uh, karate master that uh, never touched anybody except the people that he wanted to destroy so uh, i think in terms of that that's what i grew up with and i think it's a very familiar tale to other people um so that i think definitely had an effect on me um because like when i was growing up i didn't want to be asian at all uh, and i think that a lot of asians and a lot of adoptees can relate and sympathize and empathize with those feelings as well um, so, uh, yeah, growing up in high school and stuff like that, it definitely did a lot of things to my confidence. Um, I didn't ask anybody out uh, in, throughout high school or college. Oh, wow. So you never even dated in college until you probably just dated just recently, right? Yeah, it was in recently, I'd say within this last year. Um, so, um, so, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that was going on throughout all that. Um, but with that being said, a lot of it was also, it was a lot of trauma, I think, too, just from being adopted um, and, and being me and Asian. I think I'm never going to deny that that's not a, a pressing thing that I think about and that I have to think about that a lot of other men don't have to think about. Um, so I definitely think about those things. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, it's a very, very interesting uh, conversation. It's a very uh, nuanced I think it's a really touchy topic because I, I feel like it's it's kind of pinning males versus females or whites versus uh, Asians. And that's why I kind of had a really difficult time bringing this up because I knew it would kind of start it would kind of start something in people. I mean, it starts a fire in me and me being so intertwined with rejection and uh, finding other females, it, it, it kind of affects me. I, I guess you can go ahead and explain. Uh, so there's this, there's these two, there's these 
it kind of twists. So with men in general, they're either nerdy, undesirable, or into kung fu, while women are submissive and China doll like. And I guess women have the ulti- ultimate reason to say that they don't like the attention because they are viewed as sex objects. But men, it's different. So I feel that since this is just a topic about men, we'll just kind of stick towards men and just the perspective I see. But I don't know if you heard of it. We'll just get into it. But there's this stereotype that Asian men have small dicks. And because of that, I think that is something that I can kind of relate to, even though I don't. But I think that's been one of the stereotypes that people say in general about Asian men. And that stemmed to, like, the... Although we remain youthful, it, it stems to the fact that we might be uh, less mature, less alpha male, less, alpha male, less more submissive, and not, not not into sports or treated like we're shorter, which is possible. But there's just seems to be some obstacles that we seem to face. Do you agree? Um, yeah, I think it's very nuanced. Again, um, I would say that a lot of that is more or less true are, are just the stereotypes. Um, I think the stereotypes that have been made out um, have been about that. And historically, if you have done the, the research and the history on it, you know, um, the United States to kind of fend off the imperialism and the yellow peril uh, in the early 18 or the early uh, to 20th century uh, up to present day has all been about um, just demonizing the East and making it either they're exotic or that the enemy and the the, it, the most childish and also the most pressing way to do that is, you know, demonize somebody's body parts or make them feel like they're literally smaller than they are. Um, and I think that's exactly what uh, the United States has done for the last 100 years. Um, with that being said, things are changing, but I don't deny that those things are uh, that that's what America's history has been. And it's always, it's not just uh, Asian Americans and Asian men specifically. It's just anybody that doesn't fit inside of their uh, all American uh, sort of look, in my opinion. So, so I guess I want to get into it. How, how do you finally meet this girl that you're dating? Was she is she, is she American or is she Asian or maybe black or was it just some thing that you wanted to just try out since you haven't dated or is there how do you feel in general about the experience um i i think that it's it's always a changing process in my opinion um i think that it's very natural for people to like people that look like them and that obviously have shared experiences with them and i'm no different um, with that also being said i have a very open mind in my opinion towards lots of different types of people um more or less, I mean, everybody has their type, but I think that having racial preferences is probably the dumbest thing ever, and only because it completely reduces people to caricatures, and it doesn't really fully flesh out people. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't like to admit that they do that, but they do it. And the truth is, is that it's a very psychological thing. Like, people do that because they see the caricatures, and then they compare it to the caricatures, and it's just, it's built in our nature. With that being said, since I know that, I purposely go out of my way to kind of flesh out people and to say, like, I'm not going to just do that. So I am very open-minded towards a lot of people. Um, it doesn't really matter to me because I think that, again, the reasons why people are attracted to people is kind of sometimes very arbitrary. Um, and I don't know. I think that we can kind of see it now, too, though, like just the idea of white privilege, it's definitely a thing. Um, And like I said, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say though that I also believe in Asian privilege too, black privilege, anything like that. But I think that those uh, circumstances and those experiences that are collective amongst uh, Asian Americans or black Americans or really anybody that, again, outside of that mainstream is unique to them. And those problems sometimes can be very difficult to uh, kind of diagnose. So, so many adoptees like CADs especially, I don't know if you knew that was a a short term for current adoptees, but because of your your location where you grew up, which is most likely a white era, do you believe that because you grew up in a white area that it was really more difficult to find a relationship and that's why it's been so long since you've actually dated or do you actually have a different opinion on that? 
You know, I will say this. I will say that um, I think it is – I definitely think it's a factor. Um, just not being around people, I think, that really understands you. kind of feel like an alien uh, in a foreign land that doesn't feel like yours. So I think that's true. Uh, however, I came to the conclusion that it was not because I was Asian that I was like this. It, it, it was really because I was insecure, I was afraid, uh, and that I didn't really even try, and that I was very – like I never, I never took any risks. I was very closed off. So, But with that being said, that was a personal – and I think that's a character flaw for me. But with that being said – the stereotypes and everything like that, all those things didn't help me. They just helped me believe the same negative uh, perceptions of myself. Uh, and you can look at the statistics. You know, Asian Americans are more likely to be bullied in school, yet they're less likely to report it. And I think that's a big issue, too. So, I mean, I personally wasn't bullied, but I think that that's kind of like a an example of kind of like just the struggles that Asian Americans face and that they don't really talk about it, and they brushed it off. And I am no different. Like, everybody used to make Asian jokes around me when I was growing up in high school. Um, and I kind of went along with it because I'm just like, whatever. Um, but deep down, sometimes those things did hurt, and that uh, the things that they said made me feel less than a lot of the times. Um, and I think to a lot of Asian Americans, they, 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 some of them might never admit it, but those things do cut deep. Um, to them. And I, especially now these days, I don't believe in them. And I try to, um, I just don't think they're ever acceptable anymore. So. So when you went to college, did you think you got that wow factor when you've seen more diversity or was the college you went to not diverse or how did that experience? Kind of the cultural shock I was kind of mentioning when we were chatting a little earlier, he's kind of referring to when you first uh, met, uh, Another Asian more person, more races or actually Korean even. Yeah, I would say that uh, it actually started before that because uh, I went to Korea back in 2014 when I was 16 years old. So that I think was more of a a turning point and a pivot point because before then I literally didn't. I wanted to be white. I wanted to not look like me. I hated my eyes. I hated my hair. Um, I didn't like my body at all. I had no self-confidence in my body at all. Uh, but when I went to Korea, it was very rare because it was the first time I ever saw people that like looked like me and that were actually proud to be who they were. Uh, and I really liked that. I thought that was really cool. Um, and since then, like I kind of went on this trajectory of always kind of like seeking those sort of things out of finding people that are confident in their own skin and confident in every not in, in all sorts of uh, skins, I should say, all all different shades and different um, professions, anything like that. So I kind of I, I went to community college when I was sixteen, uh, and community colleges are probably the my, most diverse places I've ever been in my life. You get old people, young people, uh, you have Asian, Black, Latino, any anything really, gen or queer, gay, all those things. So I felt very exposed to that. Travis didn't know this about you. Could you can you explain your life between the the college years where you actually were homeschooled and a, a little bit? Uh, do you like uh, any specifics or? Yeah. What What was your life like? Kind of uh, being homeschooled. Did you feel isolated? Where did you have a lot of interaction with people? I know you said you did play sports outside of just staying at home. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think that uh, I guess if the question is if I would homeschool my kids, I would say maybe. Um, but I do think that my parents always made the argument of like, yeah, schools are bad influences on kids. But truthfully, I think the social ex the social uh, experience and hanging out with different people um, definitely helps with a lot of people. It can definitely hurt too. But I think on my experience, I don't think it necessarily did. It didn't really benefit me as much. Uh, and I think that I should have probably gone to um, a public school. But on the flip side of that, I a lot of the things I learn and a lot of things that I am today is because I didn't go to public school. So it's kind of like you take what you get sort of thing. So, so I guess my next question is, did your parents raise you to be white or did they introduce you to anything Korean? Cause you were actually pretty young where you got to visit Korea. So what was the thing that, that ignited all that fire? Because I didn't really get into Korean culture until I was like 2009, which is maybe, I'm 33, but that wasn't until maybe like 
I was well out of high school and in a college. So what was that that sparked your interest in Korean culture? Because did your parents pressure you or did you find just say, hey, I'm not feeling really comfortable in my skin here. I want to see what's like where I was born or is there any other inf- information that you can give us? Uh, honestly, my parents have always been extremely supportive of whatever we chose to do. Uh, but I just think that like any parent, an adopted parent, adoptee parent, like they don't, they don't want to push something that kids are not ready for. And they don't, the worst thing that could happen is they rush a kid, uh, and they basically make it all worse and their identities in complete, uh, flux. So I, I think that they had that often in mind. Um, but I think though, they were always very open. Like I said, like if we wanted to explore those things, they'd be like, yeah, let's do that. And really how uh, I went to Korea came up is because, uh, my, uh, my old church, uh, they, my mom put together some sort of mission trip, more or less kind of like a heritage trip for us. And it was sponsored by our church and sponsored by different people. So that's mainly what that was. Uh, and that was probably one of the most, yeah, that was an extremely trans, trans, um, transformative experience yeah transformational transformative experience um so uh, but in general my parents have been extremely supportive uh, my um my mom went with us actually uh to there and she i went three times actually 2014 16 and 18 and with my mom oh, did you go to the olympics or no the that was Pyeongchang? oh you did no i went in um april april and may Oh, I so, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, we actually visited our birth family in February of 2018. We went to the Pyeongchang Olympics, which is why I asked. Oh. We also went in 2008. We actually visited the first time our birth family in 2018. Did Kyle tell you that? No, nope, I didn't. Yeah, so have you had, by the way, I guess that brings another topic. Have you been able to seek your birth family out or maybe share a little bit of information if you have anything about them? I get, they gave me a lot of information when I was born. I still have um, a lot of their information. I know their ages, uh, their occupation, uh, their religion, their height, uh, their blood types even. So they gave me a lot of information. Um, but with that being said, I just I, I submitted paperwork to try to find anything, and nothing really came back. Uh, and in truth, I didn't really I wasn't really I wasn't let down by any means. Um, I just, I took it for what it was. So you seem like a very mature and uh, like kind of pretty chill kind of guy. Do you, so you actually, I think it's actually kind of remarkable you being so young, you can have such of a peaceful outlook because there's still a lot of adoptees that I feel like are so intense or so like some people are just so upset. A lot of people simply make really bad choices. His ex was a meth addict. He, she hated her parent, her adoptive parents, her birth family rejected at her age at eight. That door was kind of shoved in her when face she was like an in, uh, inner teenage. I feel like she never was the same ever since. And then they just end up in that cycle of self destruction. And I think there's a lot of, I don't know. I, that's why I asked if you met a lot of other adoptees and whether if they're actually socially uh, or in uh, uh, mentally turmoil. or at turmoil or maybe they're at peace or, or well adjusted. That's kind of what. I'm kind of seeking, and uh, maybe you can explain a little bit about that with totally. your life and other people's. Totally. Um, and I actually have. I've uh, experienced and had a lot of conversations, a lot of adoptees within the last, especially in the last two years, as I um, just have evolved, I think, in my adoption journey. But a lot of adoptees experience a lot of the same things, like most majority of them do. Uh, and I think I kind of talked about this, um, with Kyle a little bit before, but I think the biggest difference though, between say like adoptees that are 25 and younger and adoptees that are 25 and older is just the, the community and the just resources. Uh, and I, I actually know another adoptee that is uh, kind of the similar age as you is he's 31, I believe 31, 32. Um, but he also struggled a lot with his own identity, uh, and his, sense of self because he didn't have like i went to adoption camps when i was growing up i i talked to a lot of adoptees through that camp uh and one of my biggest mentors and one of my biggest big brothers i'll call him he's also adopted but i met him through that camp as well and we talk a lot about um just what i've what we've been through and just how like he's been such a a big help in me kind of like expressing that so i think that's the biggest difference uh and i think that just through this um there's an adoptee group as well on Facebook. Uh, that has been the biggest difference as well, because 
I can't imagine, you know, it, when you uh, take it back 10, 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, there was no opportunity for really a lot of people to gather like that uh, and really talk about those things. A lot of those, uh, those pressing issues were basically there was no one to talk to. Uh, really about that. I also I still had the benefit of having four adopted siblings, all from Korea as well. So we also used to talk about that as well. But, you know, just having adopted siblings sometimes isn't enough. What is your what is your opinion on them? Do you think they lived a pretty well adjusted life too? What are the age differences, by the way? Is there some in their 30s, 20s, or still in their teens? Or Are you talking about the group? No, your, 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 your siblings. Family, your siblings. Oh, I was just curious gotcha. that like, were they well adjusted and any issues met their birth family, have regrets, resentment, things like that? Uh, I think it's a mixed bag for all of us. I think though, in general, we're very well adjusted. I don't see, we don't, our parents, like I said, my parents are some of the best parents I've ever met. They're tremendous people and they, I just have so much love and respect for them. Um, so they did as best as they possibly could do under the circumstances. With that being said, yeah, I mean, I've had my share of troubles. I know my brother definitely went through this these phases. Um, and my oldest sister is 25 and my youngest brother is 15. Um, so, And my youngest brother, he has, uh, I think he's has an autism disorder. So he's on the spectrum. Um, and then my, uh, who is it? Uh, my youngest sister, who's uh, 20. D, she or 20, 19, she's 19. Uh, she has uh, a disability. She only has one hand, um, a partial hand. So there, if you're talking about the literal implications of, uh, you know, adoption and just those sort of things, yeah, they, they had those. And I've talked to them multiple times too about it. And there's definitely, uh, they definitely all have their own struggles and their own way of going about it. Um, but like I said, I think the difference is, is just my parents and their resources that they had and our resources that we have of just that we can reach out and we can connect. So were you someone that I'm just curious, were you someone that really enjoyed the cultural camps or was something that was pushed on you and yeah. you decided to go and, or did you really envelop the experience and really enjoyed interacting with other people that looked like you or maybe similar experiences? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, totally. Um, no, I love the camps. Um, I really had a good time there. And it's kind of for the opposite reasons of like uh, everywhere else, like most kids when they come to the camp, they're like, I don't like any of these kids because they don't look like me. Actually, that's very common. Um, or they look like me. It's really like it's weird, you know, culture. It's a I kind of like I think it's a, kind of like a reverse culture shock. So that was a thing. Uh, but I wasn't like that. I, I loved uh, being able to finally talk about things with people and actually feel like, oh, wow, like I'm actually – I'm like everybody else now. Um, so, and a funny story, actually, when I was at camp once, I had a different colored t-shirt when I was, I think, in the fourth or fifth grade. Uh, and I cried right on the spot because I wanted the same shirt as everybody else did. So uh, I think that just goes to show you how uh, important those camps were to me and just being a part of that uh, community. So, I think you have a really great perspective because they're actually – there's actually some Korean adoptees that felt like that their their culture was forced. But are, are you generally like a pretty uh, social individual then? You you are not shy and you were able to uh, come out of your your shell? I think, like, I, I'll always say this and just about my own life, and I'm not embarrassed to say it. I've just, no, I wasn't. I was not a very social person. I was very shy and very afraid of other people. I couldn't look people in the eye. Uh, for a long time, um, I had very low confidence. Um, but in like the last two, three years, things have just definitely changed. And I just have a different view of myself to the point where like I do, I enjoy spending time with people. Uh, I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy looking at, looking in them in the eye, I enjoy just experiencing life with them. So um, I don't, I think it's just more a matter of um, just deciding that I wanted to do something different. So could you uh, give credit to the reason why you changed and you why you kind of wanted to come out of your shell? Do you think it's because you visited Korea at 16 uh, next to uh, these your cultures parents or... and your good parents? What kind of made you want to explore. transform and explore? That's a good question. Uh, I wish I could give you a singular answer of like what specifically it was, but I can't. 
it's not one moment. Uh, it's more like a collection of moments. Um, but I think that, yeah, going to Korea was a huge a stepping stone, in my opinion. Uh, going three times is huge. Um, cause like, I would say the first time I was just like, I love Korea and I love my culture and I love everything about it. I would read everything I could about it. I love, I try to immerse myself in it at all. I went to a Korean church for six months. Um, uh, but on the flip side of that, like when I went to the Korean church, I didn't really feel Korean. Like I felt less Korean when I was there actually. Um, cause they didn't, I, I they're always speaking Korean and I, they were definitely different from me. Um, so the next time I went to Korea, it was like I kind of rejected it and pushed it, pushed it away. Um, so the flip side of that. Um, but I would just say the reason why I wanted to change is just that I, I think that I used to use adoption as a crutch. I used to say like, oh, well, I'm adopted. And like no one – like I, I wish I could have see my real parents. And like well, I wonder what my life would be like that. But I just came to like the conclusion and just the end of myself to say like just – it's the past is the past. And as much as you want to like change it, as much as you want to go back and redo things, you can't. And the only thing you can do is like pick yourself up and move forward. Um, and I think that was the hardest lesson for me to learn. Cause I think that most of my life up till I was 20 was chasing the past and was trying to chase things, uh, that I didn't have. And it just didn't really make me happy. Uh, and I just realized I can never get it back. So. Okay, so another topic that the reason why we started this whole channel was related to mental health. And I think mental health is really important when it comes to the Korean adopted community. My next question to you is, have you ever had feelings of like crisis or depression or any other mental health Kind of like what we were that, talking about with suicidal daily. You, you kind of that mentioned that maybe, you did not have. That maybe caused you issues or actually was the experience pretty well when it comes to your mental health? Um, I would say that I was relatively well adjusted. I don't really just naturally, I don't feel like super sad all that much. There are better days, obviously, than others. Um, and there were definitely dark times, you know, when I was uh, in high school, 16, 17, 18, those are tough, very tough. And there are many days where I was just like, uh, it's just, I have like a few things that are kind of keeping me afloat, but I'm kind of just like a little, a little down on some things. Um, but I would say I don't, I don't really feel like it's serious. Like none of it, in my opinion, was ever pressing enough to me to say like, oh, well, like I need to, like, I'm, I need something, you know? Um, but, um, I don't want to be the person that self-diagnoses myself. Um, but at the same time, like I personally don't, uh, I don't, I don't think at least in my opinion that it was all that, uh, all that, uh, important or, yeah, it wasn't. I don't think so. But um, with that being said, I, I went to go. I went to counseling too, because um, I think everybody should. Um, but you know, just to kind of like sort through a lot of my own identity issues and my adoption issues uh, and my even my own masculinity, I had to sort through a lot of those things. Uh, and I feel like I am like ten times further along because of those things. So, can you explain a little bit of examples of, of how you learned to accept your your masculinity and your Asian-ness, could you explain a little bit of uh, some of the thoughts that you actually changed? Yeah, well, kind of going back to my own self-image, uh, like I, I literally did not think that anybody would ever like me. And I'm not talking about girls. I'm talking about guys, too. I thought no one liked me. I genuinely thought no one liked me, and I, I always thought it was because I was different, and I was like the weird kid. Um, and I always was trying to like be accepted and fit in. Um, but when I went to counseling, that's the biggest thing that we tried to undo to say like, you know, once you talk about it and one of my favorite uh, public speakers, Brenny Brown talks about this a lot of just like the more vulnerable you are, the more you just admit your shame, the more you just get used to it. And you just like, you just don't feel shame anymore. Um, because like, I think like this is, uh, this is not this is not just unique to Asian Asian men with uh, penis sizes, whatever. A lot of men actually have a lot of bodily insecurities that they don't talk about, and I did for a long time too in my whole body. But by me talking about it in counseling, uh, and me saying like, yeah, sometimes I don't feel that attractive. Sometimes I feel like I'm short, or not even short. I don't feel that short, but I feel skinny, you know, or I feel whatever. 
I feel bad that I have this hair, blah, 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 any of those things. But the more I would talk about it and the more I would say like, oh, yeah, I feel this way. And the more I got reaffirmed from that, the more I just became much more comfortable in myself to say like – and not to mention the more you open up and the more you explain yourself and the more you open about your struggles – it allows other people to do the same thing. So I, by me opening up, I saw other people that also struggled through the same things. And that just made me think to myself, like, these are people that are far more successful that don't even look like me, but they're talking about like, oh, well, sometimes I feel this way. And I'm just like, wow, if they feel that way, they technically have more than I do, but they feel this way. So I don't think I should have any excuses necessarily to feel that way anymore. So, so even if you didn't have mental health issues, you did seek counseling. So my question to you is, it seems like that the accessibility was there. So were you covered on your mom's insurance or how did that work? Or, or maybe the accessibility wasn't there, but you were able to get it anyway, or was it through school or private or tell us a little bit about that so i was through my school at the beginning just because um it was free and i was just like this is very good i actually started out as career career advice but it kind of delved into a whole new different uh, breed of just identity because i think even your career is such a part of who you are so i did that and after that you know my uh counselor said yeah i'm actually gonna start my own practice i'm gonna give you a discounted rate so I'm like, I might as well just take advantage of that discounted rate. Um, and I did. Uh, and um, it was actually a very traumatic experience, I think, um, that kind of led me to go to it more often because I think it was my brother. My brother left for school, and then I, my parents just moved to Montana. So, or yeah, I, I was kind of getting over that whole phase. Um, but all those things combined kind of like pushed me to go there because I was the type of person I was like, nah, counseling, why do you need counseling? Just talk to talk to people about it. You'll be fine. But just the act of going for me was the big difference. Uh, just to say that you did it and to have that relief and that safe space to talk about things is what really made a difference in my life. Were you scared as hell to, uh, going to counseling? And you seem like really open talking about counseling. Uh, did, you have, did you feel comfortable telling your parents that you're going to counseling or you need counseling? Uh, I, I briefly mentioned it to my parents here and there, uh, and honestly, that's the one thing I tell my parents and any, any adoptee or real, anybody, 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 anybody really should go to uh, counseling. Um, so I, yeah, I have definitely suggest that. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't, it was, it was good. You know, um, I would, I, yeah, I would never take it back. Um, so my parents were fine, honestly, with it. My mother went to counseling, uh, for plenty of years, uh, for a lot of the things that were just in, in, within her, her own personal life. So she was totally open for it. And I think that, uh, that was great. So, okay. So we'll delve a little bit deeper in the relationships. Again, uh, if, it's, if you're uncomfortable, you can, you can just say, uh, uh, you don't have to uh, answer. So I know you mentioned that the relationship you had, you just weren't into her do you i know you're really young and you haven't been on a lot of dates with a lot of women and i don't know are, are you getting a lot of uh, girls that are trying to show interest in you or you're not aware of it or can you explain a little bit of the situation with your dating life well right now it's a little skewed so i don't <laughs> i don't know if that's a fair assessment um but before you know i don't i didn't even think like i i think that like i said uh just having that that vulnerability and that uh the overcoming of shame really em like it, it empowers me and it gave me a lot of confidence because um, like the last time I was out, I was in San Diego and like I was just talking to a bunch of girls and uh, I, had a, I had a great time. Um, so I don't think of it. I think uh, it's tough to say, though, right now, just because it, <laughs> it's the government doesn't even recommend you go out sometimes. But um, but at the same time, like, I would say that, yeah, if you were to compare it, though, like two, three, four years ago, it's like exponential how much has changed. Um, and I do relate that more to my own, uh, my, my lifestyle change uh, and things like that. Uh, however, I would say that, yeah, it's definitely difficult. It's different and difficult. Um, it's I can see it and I notice it. Um, 
and it's not fair always, but um, at the same time, I just try to make do with the best I can. So, so do you have abandonment issues and trust issues when you were dating this person? Did you have that fear or with counseling, you kind of, you are, have such a solid sense of self that you're not insecure like that. Uh, could you explain a little bit of your emotions at that time? And maybe no. Yeah, I would say that um, it was a work in progress. And I think like everything, it's a work in progress. Uh, and for me right now, it's a work in progress. With that being said, I am extremely happy with the progress I made in the last two years. Uh, I had extremely big issues, honestly, with finishing jobs or sticking with a job. I would turn down jobs, job offers, because I was afraid that they'd let me go one day. And I was afraid that I would do bad and that they wouldn't let me. They wouldn't, I would just not work for them again. So I would turn jobs down for that. Um, and I think in terms of women, I think a lot of it was more just a matter of like I was I would never I think that adoptees have two kind of modes. They have the cling mode where it's like once I have you, I'm never going to let you go. So you're going to stay with me forever. And the runaway mode, maybe. <laughs> yep. And then the other one is exactly that. They have the runaway mode where it's just like you'll never, ever get close to me because, yeah, you'll just never get to me. Uh, and I experienced both. Honestly, uh, I would say most of my life I was a runner. I love running away from those things, uh, and I would never get close to people because I didn't want them to come into my life and then just leave again. So uh, that was a lot of me. But in the last year, I've worked through it a lot. You know, I worked my internship, and I finished it out, and I did a good job. Um, that was the first kind of experience I've had with working more full-time. Um, but that was huge stepping stone. And with that girl, too, it's just like just even – even considering the option and kind of fleshing it out was a huge step forward because a lot of the times in the past, I wouldn't even try. I would not even try because, again, that idea of running. So um, actually, the right now what's happening is more of the cling sort of thing where it's just like I want to find somebody or do something. I just want to cling really hard. Um, but I'm also kind of trying to work through a lot of that stuff too, and I feel like I'm still in a in a good or good, a pretty good place, honestly, uh, with a lot of those stuff. But again. You know, who knows? A lot of things can change uh, and improvements are always a possibility. My brother is asking, are you dating right now or are you single? I'm not dating. I mean, I'm, I'm dating. I mean, I'm trying to date, um, but okay. right now I'm yeah, not seeing anyone. Um, but um, I'm, yeah. So at this moment with your adoptive issues, uh, say you just found someone you really, really like uh, because you worked all your issues, you feel like you actually can commit to this person and, and maybe have the ability to love a woman do you feel like you're at that stage yeah but I, i'll be on, i'll be completely honest too i think that um a lot of me like i i try everybody's told me i have very high standards but i personally believe i have standards to protect myself from i if i have high standards right i say here and then people don't meet my standards i'll just be like well you know i knew it was going to fail so i'm i'm I, i'm protecting myself from rejection because I don't try. So I'm very aware of that. And I am very open about that too. And I work, th I'm working through that a lot. And I still, <clears throat> I feel much better about that piece as well. Um, but that has a lot of, a lot of the reasons too, that I just kind of like cut myself off from people because again, I, it's like kind of like that thing of like, you know, you set the bar really high. So then if you fail, you're just like, well, I failed. So it's like, I tried, but I failed. So but it's not on me, you know? So so are you that are you that type of guy that networks or through jobs or through friends or mutual people that you find up ending with a relationship or do you do the good old fashioned like Tinder or dating Online. sites, East Meet East or Korean Cupid or things like that, other dating sites? What is your preference and have you had any luck with that? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> in this last year, things have definitely changed just because uh, obviously we had to switch to online. So I've been using a little bit more online stuff. Um, so like Hinge, Tinder, all those things, blah, 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 it's, it's been, which has been fine. Um, but I, I personally think that um, that's the downfall of technology. I think that uh, while it is an option and it's a good option, I just don't think it's the best option. And I feel I was real i was fine with networking i didn't really i i didn't really care um and i enjoy just talking to people and getting to know people so it doesn't bother me so yeah so uh, i guess right now i guess uh why don't you explain a little bit of your your uh uh 
to me, I guess, explain a little bit of your experiences with online so dating and share to, to me, share uh, to him sh- about share what you my experience. Uh, I'm 33. I've had I've been single for five some years now, but I really haven't been able to get the chance to date anyone else. Is there a reason so why I've been, been on many dating sites, but my most recent one is the catfish foods. I'm 33 and she pretended to be this Korean girl who's like 25, but she ends up being a 13 year old girl. So that's definitely not good for me. And that doesn't look good for me at all. But I've kind of struggled with this for years. I've actually, my previous relationship was actually on Korean Cupid and I met her. She's actual Korean from Korea. And that's how I met her. Uh, do you feel yourself in your situation right now that you'll never experience that and you feel just happy being single or are you are you a guy that's looking and finding rejection or do you feel like maybe something will happen i i'm still hopeful about it um i don't know i think that it's important to be content uh more or less or where you're at um in any situation because i think desperation sometimes isn't uh good and i that's i i I struggle with that on and off because i think society tells us especially as men that our worth comes through sexual encounters and our worth comes through our sexuality um but if that's true if that is true then that means well i mean you should say sexuality especially with women right but if that is true then that means people that are asexual people that are gay any of those things, they're not men then, right? People won't consider them as men. So me personally, I realize that real quick and I say to myself, like, those things are not really, they're not good measures in my opinion to measure a person by. Because I've known people that have, my sister, for God's sake, she she did all these crazy sexual things. And I, I just think though that like, it doesn't make me think of her any less or more. But I don't think that it's it's not a good measure, in my opinion, of a human being. Um, so that by getting that block out of the way, though, it helps me to just say, like, you know, it makes you look for something more holistic and looks makes you look for uh, something a little bit more substantial. Now, with that being said, I think that it's great to enjoy people and enjoy uh, time and life. I think everybody should do that. I just don't believe in selling out for it. Uh, and I think that I struggled with that a lot in my, my, uh, my life because, you know, I think that's the hardest part about being Asian sometime an Asian man is because it's, that's exactly it. You know, United, not even the United States, just the whole world, uh, men's value comes from what they can provide sexually and uh, what they can make all these things. Right. Um, but like, like I said, if that were the case, then people that poor men, men that have no money are worthless. You know, if that is the case. Then people that are five foot three, men that are five foot three have no worth. But to me, that's a lie. I don't think that's true at all because they obviously haven't met those people and they don't know what they're worth. So I just try to make it more holistic, in my opinion. Um, and I think that having that more holistic outlook kind of makes me have a better attitude towards it at all. Again, with that being said, I get jaded like anybody else. It's tough. Uh, and I think just modern dating is kind of a travesty because it's it's all about instant instantaneous instantaneous. Are you, actually, are you I'm curious. There's a lot of Americans on Tinder, like white people. Do you actually find yourself getting swipe left, or do you actually get people that actually are interested in you? It's a mix. Um, when uh, Tinder <laughs> when Tinder had their uh, free fat passport thing, it was actually really good. I used to talk to a lot of girls. Uh, and I enjoy talking to them. Um, but no, I mean, I've seen the studies and I've, I've done the research. So I think that there's definitely a huge disparity. Uh, they're showing, um, I remember one like mini experiment. There was one, a very attractive Asian man, and he had like a thousand likes. Um, but then another person, I think a regular, just a white American, he had like 5,000. So I think it's true. I don't, I don't discredit that. Um, but to that point, I think that is exactly why. I'm curious, does that narrow your choices then? Are you looking for someone other than white? Or maybe do you feel like, well, maybe there's someone that will like me, whether I'm black or white or Asian? Or how do you feel about just generally about the the situation that you experience with all the the ideologies regarding the stereotypes and what you encounter on like dating sites? 
Um, I feel like I think that in the end, I want authenticity. Like, I think that that's exactly, like I said, why online dating is just pathetic. And I think that it's not often, I think at least for young people, it's not, doesn't do them any good uh, most of the time. And I think the reason why is because it reduces people to, again, it reduces people to four or five pictures. It reduces them to a catchy pickup line. And I think that, like, that's not how reality works. Like, when you go see people, they are the the sum of all the parts, they're not just the parts individually. So uh, I think that's exactly why there's flaws in uh, online dating because because you have it just refers to stereotypes in my opinion. And I'm just curious, it brings up another question. You went to Korean camps. Why never you dated there when you're younger than 18? I don't, was did you just never thought about it or you weren't attracted to them or they were from different cities and that's, I'm just curious, how come you, if you went, the, if if I personally experienced that, I'd be looking for the girls and see if I could hook up with anyone, but I was just totally not into the culture at the time. So what's, what's your explanation on that? I would say that, for one, the reason why is that I just don't honestly think I really cared as much, because I always tell myself, like, if I really wanted to do it, I would do it. It's not like I couldn't do it. I know I could do it. But it's a matter of like, I just didn't care. Like, I really just didn't care. Like, I thought I cared. But the truth is, is I really didn't care enough. So that's one. Uh, the second reason I think was still insecurities. Like, I just didn't really think I had any chance either. So it's like those two things in a combination kind of just made me say like, well, I just don't. Like, I just don't. I didn't honestly find a lot of people, like I said, that had a lot of substance. Uh, and I don't know if like I was just reducing people to exactly what i accuse other people of doing but at the same time i would say that some people are exactly like what they present themselves as and i think that a lot of the times it's very true uh and i don't feel like there's a lot of depth amongst people in a lot of cases um so but i think that a lot of that is my i would take that as my responsibility to say like people aren't deep because you're not looking for deep people and you're not really even trying so i take that on myself to say like that is my fault so I have to accept that, and I do. So many people have you uh, uh, dated. Uh, is it a? Can you uh, give a number, or is it something that you? Uh, it was just one. It was okay, just one. So just yeah. One. Have um, you I've, experienced heart? Have you experienced heartbreak yet? Then heartache, maybe. Because uh, yeah. I know you're so young. Oh, okay. How were you during that time? Uh, it was. And what it, did was you do it was tough. It was tough. Um, but it really helped me reshape the way I think of love and the way I think rethink the way I think of relationships. Uh, what, and, what is that? Well, because I think that society kind of pushes us this idea that relationships and love and sex is like the best thing ever. And the truth is it can be. But a lot of the times, a lot of the times people get into bad relationships uh, because they, 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 they sell out or not. They, they buy into what is being sold uh, and it's glamorized everywhere we go, right? They're like, oh, look at all look at all this, like they're coddling or they're doing this and they're doing that. But what we don't see is we don't see the fights. We don't see the times of loneliness when people are gone. We don't see the the doubt that we have for other people in our lives. We don't see, we only see the smooth sailing and we only see the tip of the iceberg. We don't see everything underneath. So I learned that a lot too, just from my experience with a girl, but also with just looking at my other siblings, um, that they, they, I think like anybody, they, um, they, they bought into that, that sort of mindset too, which isn't bad. It's a great to learn, but it's just a lesson of like, love isn't like that. And I, I can tell from my own parents that love is something like, I can genuinely say that I don't love anybody except for my parents and my family, uh, because of the, the commitment and the amount of, uh, dedication that we have to each other. And even though it wasn't perfect and we had lots of fights, we were always there for each other. And to me, that's what love is. Your parents itself must be a good example because uh, I think a lot of Americans in general or people in the world are getting divorced. I mean, our, our parents actually divorced and I know quite a bit, um, but I guess they were able to hold it get together and maybe that kind of affected you to have more of a positive viewpoint of relationships and marriage in general. Oh, I 100% agree. Uh, and I say that because my own father, his dad was not a part of his life. 
his father also cheated on uh, my grandma multiple times. Oh, wow. And my mm. dad had extremely difficult times uh, growing up. He had extremely difficult – he had a lot of insecurities about who he was and what he, and, and what he provided as a man because his own father wasn't even in his life. So mm. my dad is a perfect example of that. Um, but I'm proud of Tim to say that he did it differently. He could have he easily never, nope. he never followed the pattern of his grandpa where he ended up cheating too and his dad, I yeah. Mean, the, the dad, his dad, yeah. exactly. Um, okay. and I think that's extremely admirable. And I look mm -hmm. at my grandpa now and I look at him, I'm just like, You're such a sad man. He has mm -hmm. four he had five wives, he's cheated wow. multiple times. Uh, and I look at him now, he's a sad man. He has no family. He the only family he has is us, and we see him maybe once a year. And he 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 just doesn't have i don't think he has much substance at all so i think that i see right through it and i'm very uh i'm, I'm i think it's really cool so i'm curious a lot of families that adopt they usually are pretty well off was your family pretty well off what was what kind of occupations did your 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 parents support you with was it middle class or any financial issues or maybe it was just pretty much a good stable family uh, I was, I think it was extremely stable family. Looking back on it, like there's very few things that I'd say like that my parents, uh, that they lacked in terms of love, in terms of care, in terms of resources. My dad was a corporate lawyer, so he was very well off. He was very, he went to law school, all those things. So very well off. My mother was a manager of, uh, HR. So also very successful. Um, so yeah, there was, there was no, none of those things. Like, did they, were they able to put you guys as a priority even though that they had all these prestigious jobs prestigious or, job. or always just learn to accept it oh always i mean like i said my parents are just amazing like we have disagreements now but i have so much respect for them because i know that at the end of the day they will always fight for me they'll always be in my corner so is there a reason why they decided to adopt a whole bunch of korean kids or were they, was she able to not have children, maybe not have children, or was it just something that she, my mother had issues with infertility for years. Um, they wanted to have kids, uh, for many, many years. Um, but she, she just struggled. And, uh, I think one of her friends adopted another, a kid, uh, and they wanted to adopt, uh, well, they wanted to adopt because of that. So that's really what happened. And really just the rest was history. Just. They're like, we want this kid and that kid. I don't know why we had five, but uh, they just felt it, that they needed to do it. And sometimes I ask myself, like, that's a lot. But then I also say to myself, like, you know, they wanted to do it, and they did such an amazing job doing it. So at the end of the day, it's only power to them to say that their decisions were justified. So I, I guess since you had such a good example growing up uh, through your parents' There's a few adoptees that had such horrible experiences uh, through their adoptive parents and their maybe their birth family as well. And it kind of spreads through a pattern that they don't want children themselves. You growing up in a pretty stable household, do you see yourself wanting to get married and have kids and you see yourself being happy in that type of uh, do you find yourself wishing that or do you actually are OK with what you're at now, uh, even if you are single? I mean, I'd love to get married. My goal is to get married one day. Um, my goal is to you know, have kids of my own. Or I really don't care at this point. Like I, I think I, I'm adoption, adopting kids myself would be very difficult just because my own experience, just judging off of my own experience, I can't imagine what it'll also be like. It'll also be very like, I, I don't honestly think, I'd love to think that my adoption experience would help me with children, adopted children. But in my opinion, it's so different for each adoptee that the truth is, is that it doesn't matter. Like, it's just more about how you handle it. So, um, I'm very open though, in terms of like what my family will look like. And, um, I don't see myself really ever really getting married anytime soon, at least 10 years in my opinion. Um, but it's not, it, it's definitely something I think about and I think about often. So I'm just curious, this is just a side note. I mean, like you had a good adopted family. We had a good adopted family. We actually visited our birth family, and I guess you tried. But my my question is: Are you actually aware of all the experiences that people have regarding these horror stories of adoption? Oh, 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 yeah! I've heard of a lot of bad stories. Um, I would say definitely more so thirty on up. 
and anybody born in like the 1980s of the anybody be born before the 90s i would say in korea and even early 90s is kind of tough but um anybody be born before that i've heard just such horrible things um i remember reading about a story of just like a kid he was adopted when he was like four or five and he was just walking the streets of korea and they just adopted him out <clears throat> and um i've heard a lot of stories of uh korean girls getting adopted too and they're basically once they got to the states they were abused and they got into abusive relationships uh and it just kept going on and the cycle repeated itself so it was horrible i it's anything the 80s was not kind to adoptees um the 90s were much better and a lot of my friends are in, and were born in the 90s and the early 2000s uh and just the whole the whole shift in the the korean government the chinese government because i know chinese adoptees as well <clears throat> The whole shift has just changed dramatically, uh, and the amount of support that adoptees have, the amount of community that they have, like I said, is just completely different. So I'm very appreciative of that fact. So can you explain? You, you've been around quite a bit of other uh, adoptees. Are you? Have you known anyone in person that had traumatic experiences at all? And are you? You can take my own and... sister. My own sister. Really? She used to cut herself. Um, wow. Your so your sister had psychological issues, even if. She, uh, you guys had a really good family, you're saying, huh? Right, right. Interesting. And she left okay. home when she was 16. Um, I'm never sure. <clears throat> I can never honestly say how much adoption ever plays into that stuff because I do think that at the end of the day, like, people make their own decisions regardless of their past or not. Um, but I don't think it helped. I never think it helped her. Uh, her own mother, uh, she, I think her mother was 16 when she had my sister. So a lot of history, I think, was there for her. And she had many traumatic experiences. Her first boyfriend was extremely abusive. Um, and, yeah, just in general, just not a good person, in my opinion. So, yeah, I, yeah, I've, she's told us all those things. And she, she was, like, raped in a parking lot, for God's sakes. I have a lot of compassion for the, the type of adoptees that have those kind of issues. And, and I'm sure you yourself, uh, what is some advice that you can give? I know that you yourself seem to grow up well, but I guess even if your sister, she had issues what so just is to your, add yeah. so just to add to that like my clarity is that there's a lot of adoptees that believe adoption is basically uh childhood trafficking and they believe it so much that they want something to completely get rid reduce of reduce adoption to zero and i'm just curious since you had a good adoption what are your thoughts on that and how how do you feel these people can handle it when they have such a bad experience. How, how can they, how can they heal? I don't know how to, such I don't, per, on a personal, I don't know how I could help them because I had such a good adoption. Do you have actually any, any say advice. or advice for that? Or since your sister experienced something like that? And, and what is she doing now? Is she better off right now? Oh, or she's, she's, she's married now and okay, she's great. very okay. happy and I'm very happy for her. So that's that. Um, I think the best advice I would give is kind of like what I experienced with my ado our domestic adoptees because I used to – I did a camp uh, where I was in charge or I was yeah, counseling uh, domestic adoptees. Um, and I think one of the biggest things you can do – because those kids, they are very similar in the sense of like those kids come from very broken families. I've heard a lot of kids that come up through the system. You know, their parents basically neglected them. Their parents didn't feed them. Uh, these are extreme examples, but they happen. Uh, but even at even in the best case scenarios, their parents might see them here and there, right? And they might kind of take care of them here and there and have some loving experiences. But they're four, five, six, even twelve when they get adopted out, and all those stuff press on them. So the uh, the advice I'd give to them and kind of like for them to grow up is community. I think being around other adoptees and having that safe place to talk to them. And having an opportunity to like be around people that are like you is huge, absolutely huge, uh, because the more they can talk about, the more that they can share, and that they can have strength in numbers per se, uh, the more I think that they can uh, they can they can kind of suffer through it. Honestly, is what really what it is, because it's not like the suffering will go away if they talk about it per se, but it's kind of like a um, catharsis, in my opinion, for them. Uh, and I would say that's very similar for a lot of older adoptees or anything like that, just to uh, kind of like air it out. Uh, and because uh, I think that 
at least for me, my, my struggles were difficult because I'd never had people to talk to about uh, what I felt and I'm what curious, I thought. Did your, did your sister ever blame your adoptive parents for them raising her wrong or? Oh yeah. Oh, really? uh, I would say that they did. Yeah, she did. I did. Uh, all of us did growing up here and there. Um, but I think deep down we knew that they honestly had their, be our best and, uh, our best interest. Yeah. And in, in, in not here with us I'd like to talk, but could you explain through your own lens? Uh, how was she able to heal from not that, that bad pat pattern of, uh, being, uh, I guess not liking herself and then end up falling for men that uh, abuse her and, and that kind of bad, how was she able to stop it? I guess. And uh, she it. also, she also went to counseling. She actually okay. saw a uh, counselor that was adopted special, a specialist in adoption. Okay. So great. That was wow. huge for her. Very huge. Um, the second thing I think it was definitely time uh, and space. In the sense of like she didn't spend a lot of time alone. She didn't spend a lot of time to reflect on the decisions and the feelings that she had. So when she had the time and she, she went to counseling in between, I think all three of those things really helped. And I think the final thing too is faith and love from her family uh, and especially our parents. It's, it's extremely difficult, I think, when other people are going through trauma. Uh, because the first thing that your parents, my parents want to do, and I want to do is just step in there and say, like, you need to stop doing this. But at the end of the day, like, if you step in and she's just going to do the same thing, it's like, that's not your decision. So you as so, her brother, you had frustrations with your sister, you'd say, when she cut herself and you, would you get mad and, or were you able to kind of step back and let her figure, let it her out. figure it out and not hold the reins, let go of the love kind of a little bit, I guess. I mean, my sister is a very uh, headstrong woman. She's a very, very solid girl, and she wouldn't – I think that if I stepped in, she would be like, no, I can take it. I will give that to my sister that she is probably one of the more tough – she is one of the toughest people I know because she can sit in there in the line of fire and just take it. Uh, and she has dealt – and she deals it back. She's very strong in that way. Uh, and I think that that's very impressive in my opinion. So, um, I would love to, but at the same time, like it's not my place. Uh, and I don't think it would change anything. So, well, I guess, are there any other things that you want to share before we, we end the call? This is a pretty long chat, but I, I think it's really, I guess it's therapeutic, I guess, even for me. And I, oh, and I think it's therapeutic for my interviewees too, so they could get a little bit of things off their chest and, uh, share this kind of stuff. I think it's really important to talk about. I don't think Facebook or, or social media is the best place to do it, but I really like doing these videos because it's, it's a bit more at a, a civilized kind of back and forth and you, you don't get like that, that toxicity of, of the backlash and kind of the, the, the bullying mentality, I feel like, in those polls. So I really appreciate your time. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, I, I think it's good. I mean, like I said, the more that I do this, the more that I'd be open about it to say like, yeah, this is what I have, the more I feel less shame about anything. Uh, and I honestly can tell you, though, that's exactly how I got through a lot of it. It's just doing the same thing I've been doing. It's just saying like, I'm open and I, I'm, I'm just very happy and grateful that, you know, people listen to me like you guys um, and that I have safe places to talk about those things because, you know, we it, there's probably a lot of mutual feelings and uh, identity crisis is that uh, is uh shared among us so are you interested in, in uh doing another interview with other people because there's another guy that i could forward you to if you if you want to still speak totally yeah okay um, and i'd love to just talk to you guys about okay. uh, more kind of like yeah. more in depth of kind of like what you've been writing mm -hmm. uh and what you've been talking about because i empathize again with a lot of those things and i want to help people kind of like process through those things because okay it's my tough. last my last question for you is this so you may not have had a lot of mental health issues, but you did go to counseling. So my question to you, mental health is pretty important. I understand whether it's you who have it or you know someone like your sister that might need extra help with counseling. My question to you, what is the best advice you could give someone that might be in a crisis or in a bad state of mind or suicidal? What are some things that you could tell them that, hey, life is okay and generally t get them into a more positive state what's mindset, mindset? Well, what is some advice that you might yeah. have as maybe if you're talking to your sister too maybe yeah, i guess i think 
A lot of the times I would just, I'd first give them a hug. I think that the power of physical touch is so much more powerful than we ever can imagine. Um, but I would just say from my experience, it's just like, you know, it's okay, like maybe the life doesn't seem okay now, but just let's try to get through this five minutes, five minutes, give it all out, you know, get it all out five minutes, then make it 10, then make it 30, you know, make it an hour, 24 hours, you know, it's, it's life seems so hard when you try to make it like seven days, like, oh, sh like shit, I have to get through seven days of this torture. But if you can say to yourself, like, it's just, let me get through today. Today might not be great, but what can I do today that makes me feel better? It's huge. Um, and I don't know, just tell people that, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's not, don't feel bad. Don't feel the shame that you have to feel this way. It's okay. It's really, it, it is okay to be not okay, honestly. Um, yeah, and I think that's very, very true. So. I think you're really wise for your age, especially being so young, but I really appreciated this talk with you. Thanks. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and like I said, yeah, I'm, I'm open, I have open line of communications really with anyone. Um, just, just let me know. I'm curious. Um, what are, what are your hobbies and what, what are the things you like to do and what are the things you specialize in your job? Because we might have some resources for you if you're interested in just doing some volunteer work within the CAD community. It, we don't know now, but I'm just curious if, if that's something you're into and maybe there's something that you could help. I know provides. you said you're like a, a computer guy. It sounded like, or, or that's what you majored on. Yeah. So I, I, my, my hobbies is I like to read a lot. I like okay. to write. Um, I love traveling. Um, I just like going to new places and spending time with people. I love sports as best as I can. Um, so I, I don't know. I feel very pretty open to a lot of things, but okay. those like four or five things are primarily what I enjoy doing. So. I think what I'm going to do, if you're okay with it, I, I'm actually going to start sharing people's, uh, I noticed the other gentleman that's actually kind of doing these other adoptee, uh, mm -hmm. he's talking to Asian Americans in general. I think mm -hmm. it, I can't remember. It's something Asian American talking and it's, it's more of a podcast. You don't have to show your face or anything, but I think it's really great what they're doing. They've got like 15 episodes right now. And on their chat, they're actually having the interviewers, uh, uh, share some of the, like personal information like their facebook page and maybe our viewers if you're okay with it that it'd be okay for them to reach out to you would if you ever want to do it uh yeah would you ever want that? yeah if you like to write i, I do some of these uh, documentaries i could send that to you as well it, it yeah. kind of a person just wrote uh a person just wrote like what their adoption experiences was and i just would go get b-roll kind of footage so we yeah. can do that too eventually in the future too yeah, no, I'm I'm open. Like I said, I I am your resource, honestly. Um, use me however you need. Um, but I I I I I believe in the community, so I'm yeah, I'm open to really doing anything. So great, thanks. All man. right, seem like a great guy. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah.